Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, just from the pre-talk, I think we're going to be in for a very energetic, impassioned um, session tonight. I'm Dawn Campbell. I'm your IAPCNM host, and this is the fifth in a series of six bi-monthly masterclasses on mental health and well-being delivered by the ever popular uh, Eric Maisel, a regular speaker and supporter of the IAPCNM. Hel hello and welcome back, Eric. Hello, Don. Great to be back. You're welcome. So Eric is widely regarded as America's foremost creativity coach. So he is certainly one of the most prolific online content providers and authors I've ever met. It must be approaching nearly 60 books now on such a wide range of genres. So anybody who hasn't dipped into Eric's writing, whether it's authoritarian or coaching, please do. He's also very wise. I know this because I've read a lot of his books and I've been on quite a few of his insightful courses. So Eric is a, a psychotherapist, a teacher, founder of the Worldwide Creativity and Coaching Practice, and he's a blogger for Psychology Today. And the blog is called Rethinking Mental Health, for which he's had over 3 million views. He also blogs for Thrive Global and The Good Men Project. So Eric is about to share with us how we can support anxious clients. Now, a lot of you on the call tonight might be anxious yourself uh, because, you know, we are our own best clients. So what we're going to learn is going to help us as well as our clients. So um, I always like to find out before we get started something a little bit unique or quirky about our speakers that might surprise us. And something I learned about Eric is that he attributes much of his success to his parents' pragmatic pragmatic philosophy and his army background uh, training. And probably like many grandparents during the lockdown period, which is, you know, we're all still being quite cautious about, he's seen more of his grandchildren now than he's ever done before, caring for them while the parents are at work. Now, Eric gets up with the lark. So he's the opposite to me because I'm an owl. So he has most of his writing done by 9 a.m. And then he's free to enjoy uh, the rest of the day, which sounds wonderful. Great work-life balance. So without further ado, let's learn about anxious clients and how we can help them and help ourselves. So over to you, please, Eric, while I let even more people in. Thank you, Dawn. It's great to be here. Um, there's a lot of content in the presentation. so. Just want to let you know that um, I provided Dawn with a um, PDF of the slides, which I think she'll make available to you. So if something goes by too quickly, which it may well, um, hopefully the PDF will help you later on. So let's begin. Hopefully the slides will move. Yep. So first of all, anxiety is normal. It's part of our natural early warning system alerting us to danger. We don't want to get rid of anxiety in this sense. We want to be alerted that we shouldn't enter that alley or shouldn't enter that elevator. We, we want to be made anxious when it's appropriate to feel anxiety. Unfortunately, our early warning system doesn't work that well. And we get anxious when it's not really necessary to get that anxious. I'm sure everyone on the call knows that the world's number one phobia is not fear of flying or spiders or bridges or snakes or whatever. It's fear of public speaking. It's the idea of speaking about ourselves for a minute or two makes a large portion of the human race anxious. That just goes to show how our warning system works imperfectly because speaking about ourselves for a minute shouldn't make us feel that anxious. So you will be working with clients who are anxious. They all will be, but they're going to sh manifest that anxiety in lots of different ways. We're not going over this list, of course, but just sort of take in all the different ways that you or a client might be experiencing your anxiety as confusion or forgetfulness, etc. As I say, I don't wanna run through this list. It would take too much time. But it's just here as a visual to remind you that you, the client may not present as anxious or even say, I'm feeling anxious. As a simple example, I think Donald Trump does not appear anxious publicly 
but he has a phobia around germs. That's the way his anxiety manifests. So he's washing his hands all day long. So he's trying to act to the world like a completely non-anxious anxious person, but that's the way his anxiety manifests. So it may not be that clear to us exactly how a client's anxiety is manifesting, but you can be sure it's there. And so when we are anxious, here are some of the things we do, some effective, some ineffective, some healthy, some not healthy. The number one thing we do is we flee the encounter. We get out of there. If something is making us anxious, we leave, which is why creative folks, to take one group, have so much trouble getting their work done. Because if, if writing their novel or painting their painting starts to make them a little anxious, they will leave. And then they won't get their work done. And they won't actually even know why it was they left. Because we don't really label the anxiety correctly or carefully most of the time. It's important that we get a sense of what's causing this anxiety in addition to the basic idea that it's our early warning system against danger. Looking at these many possible causes, I think helps, helps paint a picture of what's going on. So I have a model of personality where personality is made up of three parts, original personality, formed personality, and available personality. And the idea of this model is that we come into the world already somebody. Psychology does not pay attention to that possibility that we come into the world somebody. Psychology acts like we're all coming to the world the same and then things happen. But anybody who's had kittens or puppies or kids knows that every creature is absolutely itself. We know you have a little batch or whatever they're called, litter of kittens. <laughs> I think it's a litter. You have a little litter of kittens. Some are going to be skitterish. Some are going to be calm. They're going to be different and they're going to be skitterish ones. We had four cats at one point and, and two were like Solomon or some other wise person. They just were completely calm. And two were always hiding under the bed and skittering around. They were different creatures. So if you think about this, this means that it's likely, it's impossible to know, but it's likely that some percentage of the world's population come into the world more anxious than other people already. That does not make their anxiety a mental disorder. It's just a difference. We've sort of lost track of the logic of difference, but it's just a difference. It'll be a lifelong challenge. It may mean that things will make you more anxious more quickly than the next person. You'll have to deal with that. You'll need, you'll, you will need a better set of anxiety management tools than the next person, but it would not be fair or correct to call that a mental disorder, but rather a feature of our original personality. Our experiences make us anxious, don't they? Imagine being a refugee fleeing your country. Just as an aside, I have a, an 18 year old daughter who grew up in Russia, a Russian granddaughter who left Russia to attend school in Italy. That's where she is right now in Italy. But she has had such a year of experiences that it would be impossible to imagine that she wouldn't be anxious at this moment. And she's having that freshman year adjustment disorder stuff from the year she's experienced. Who wouldn't? As we stiffen into our form personality, so we're born, we have an original personality, then things happen and we stiffen into our repetitive ways of being. And those repetitive ways of being make concrete our anxieties. Our form personality then supports our anxious nature. For instance, if we get in the habit of thinking a certain way, if we start to think thoughts that don't serve us, if we start to pester ourselves with our thinking, then that becomes built into our firm personality and then our anxious nature 
is that much harder to deal with. Our circumstances make us anxious. If a hurricane passes through as it just did in Florida here, that, that's of course going to make us anxious. The stock market may make us anxious. World politics, rise of fascism. We could name a million things that necessarily and logically make us anxious. We try to deny that anxiety because we don't want to act like we're anxious all the time. We try to press, suppress that, push that down so we can get on with our days. But right behind our ability to get along with our days is this ambient anxiety. By the way, let me remind us why I'm mentioning this. These are things to check in with clients. These are check-in ideas. You can, eat, you should, I think we should ask our clients any change in circumstances. Whatever, whatever the problem they're presenting, has something changed? Or what have your recent experiences been? Rather than going in the psychiatry, psych, psych, psychotherapy direction of looking for symptoms, you having trouble sleeping, Eat, eat changes in eating, rather than going in that direction, let's ask about circumstances and experiences. If you're born with a lot of chi, a lot of life energy, let me just say as a parenthesis, I just finished sending off a book to a publisher called Deconstructing ADHD. I know a lot about ADHD, including its um, unreality as a real mental disorder, that it's a particular kind of label rather than a mental disorder. So if you're born with a lot of life energy, a lot of chi, it's going to be very hard for you to sit still and concentrate. And the activity of sitting still is going to make you anxious because it's not, doesn't match your life force. If you're forced to sit at the dinner table not speaking or forced to sit in church listening to a sermon or forced to do X, Y, Z, it's going to make you anxious. And it's going to express itself, of course, as restlessness, tapping your foot or making, making sounds or fidgeting. That's the way it's going to express itself, but it's anxiety. See, anxiety, one of the, one of the kinds of anxiety that is studied is what's called inhibited flight. That is that if you're stuck somewhere, like in a small seat in an airplane, that increases your sense of anxiety. We're anxious in planes, not just because how does that big thing stay up there, but just that squishedness in those seats makes us additionally anxious, which is why getting up and walking up and down the aisle, if you're allowed to, helps reduce that anxiety. So especially if you were to have a child client or a teenage client or a parent who is worried about his or her child having ADHD, I hope you can get a big picture of how the child may just be having energy difficulties, not a mental disorder of any sort, but just having difficulties with energy. The proof that it's not a mental disorder is that a child with so-called ADHD can concentrate perfectly for hours on end when something interests him. Just sit there with his video game for a million hours in a row, having no trouble, no, no attention deficit whatsoever. It's just stick him in a situation that doesn't interest him and he's bouncing off the walls. The big existential questions make us anxious. Death, our life purposes, what matters to us, what's important, all of those big questions, trying to answer those big questions makes us anxious. I'm not sure if I'm gonna tackle this a little later on, but I might as well say it here while I'm here. One of the big things that I, help, that I think helps clients deal with certain existential questions are the following two big ideas. One is to help them move away from the idea that there is a purpose to life, which ultimately is an anxiety producing idea because then you're searching for it and you ain't gonna find it because there is no singular purpose to life. So helping them shift from the idea of the purpose to life to the idea of multiple life purposes with an S can be very liberating. 
then they can start to think about all the things that are important to them. They don't have to put all of their eggs in one life purpose basket any longer. It's very liberating to say to a person, let's take a look at your, your menu or list of life purpose choices, and then we'll try to figure out how to get them onto your, to, your everyday to-do list, et cetera. That way of talking frees a person up from having to go to Tibet to sit at some llama's foot or et cetera, to go seeking purpose out there. Gives them the opportunity to finally live the life they would like to live right here, right now. And similarly, a second idea is the shift from seeking meaning, which of course is one of those existential issues, the shift from seeking meaning to the idea of making meaning. Really, it's coaxing meaning into existence. We can't make meaning. But if we can get, if we can move clients off the idea that meaning is out there and lost, like a lost wallet, it's out there somewhere, it's got to be found, meaning's got to be found. This idea, this metaphor of searching for meaning is built into us over thousands of years. Man's Search for Meaning, the famous Frankel book, that idea of searching for meaning. It's outdated, but we haven't outgrown it yet. So just to, just to summarize what I just said, we can help our clients with their life purpose and meaning questions a lot just by helping them with these two particular shifts, the idea of shifting from seeking meaning to making meaning, and the idea of shifting from a singular life purpose to multiple life purposes. This is another existential issue that is, there's only so much we, could, we can control in life, of course, but we also are free to do what we're free to do. As much as we are free to do, that's what we're free to do. That's where our available personality comes in. We have an amount of personality available, available to us to assert our individuality and to be free. But acting on that individuality and freedom makes us anxious because to be an individual means to push up against society. It's really what individuality is. If you want to say what's on your mind at the dinner table, you may get slapped. If you want to say what's on your mind in, a, in, in the public marketplace of ideas, you may get slapped in some other sense from the pushback of critics. In lots of cultures, it's literally your life at stake to assert your freedom and individuality. We understand that. There are lots of cultures historically and in the present where it's just physically dangerous, not just to you. We always have to think about this. You, you can say what you want to say, but then the retaliation may be against your family. And you don't want that. Maybe you're courageous enough to face up to whatever comes at you, but you don't really want that for your family, etc. This is a big idea said quickly. The big idea of Asserting our individuality may well make us oppositional, that is, may put us in a certain relationship to our society and our culture, may make us the whistleblower or that person who's saying the emperor has no clothes. We need those people who are saying the emperor has no clothes, but there will be pushback. Our client's self-confidence erodes over time. We're receiving a client in her you know, 30s or 40s or 50s who's already had a lot of self-confidence eroded by the circumstances of life, by regrets, disappointments, failures, et cetera, by all sorts of things. And if we're not as confident as we would like to be, that's anxiety provoking itself. That means that whenever we think about trying something, and we wanna try things, right? We have our ambitions, goals, dreams, our clients have their ambitions, goals, dreams, the stuff they wanna get done. So if you just connect these simple dots, you, you dream of doing something, the next thing that happens is that your body experiences a lack of confidence. And what's going to follow are anxious feelings that you're not capable of doing the thing you would hope to do. It's a very straightforward 
three dot line from wanting to do something, not feeling confident and anxiety arising. I work with creative performing artists, have for 35 years. One of their difficulties that they don't know is a difficulty is that they've lost the ability to imagine. They've lost their imagination over time because school eroded it and the home eroded it. School said, learn facts for the tests and draw inside the lines and stop imagining, stop dreaming up things. So one of the odd things I have to help clients do is Reimagine, regain their imagination. As it stands, most human beings find it anxious, find it anxiety provoking to be asked to imagine something. If you ask a kid, can you put a salmon and a skyscraper together? They'll draw you a salmon shaped skyscraper in a split second. Oh, there, there is that child right there who, who can draw you that sh salmon shaped skyscraper. Ask an adult to put a salmon and a skyscraper together, and it's going to make them anxious, right? It's going to go. Well, I I don't. Is that even is that permitted? Is that legitimate? Is, won't I get into trouble? So it's interesting the extent to which we have lost. Most folks have lost their imagination, and how much anxiety is provoked by inviting them to try to use it. Obviously, this is a huge one. All day long, we are supposed to get things done correctly. And that's reasonable, right? There's nothing crazy about that idea of getting things done correctly. Drive on the correct side of the road, pick up our kids at three, mow the lawn. But built into that mental model of getting things done correctly is a deep fear of not getting things done correctly. A deep fear of what it feels like to make mistakes and messes. Again, for my creative clients, this is a big deal problem because if they can't get full body permission, visceral permission, not just intellectual permission, everybody has intellectual permission to make mistakes and messes. If you ask a creative person, do you have permission to make mistakes and messes? They're of course going to say, sure. But in their body, they don't like it. They don't like the idea of spending two years on a novel that doesn't work. Who would like that idea? But you've got to have that permission to spend a full two years on something that doesn't work in order to know if it will work. You can't decide beforehand that something will work. There's no guarantee of success, comma. And importantly, only a percentage of the things you do will work. That's the truth about process. Hopefully it's a high percentage, but an awful lot of the things that creative folks do are ordinary, ultimately. How many masterpieces are there in the world? Just a percentage of things. That means we have to get much more comfortable with ideas of ordinary work, good enough, mistakes and messes, all kinds of things that, that do not come easily to us because we're, one of the things that we confuse as human beings and especially as creative people so the difference between perfectionism and excellence. We're in it for excellence. We want to do excellent work, but that's different from not making mistakes and messes. That's different from being a perfectionist. Being a perfectionist will stop you in your tracks. You can certainly harbor the desire to do excellent work. But what that only means is that you must show up and see what happens. That's the only way you can get your excellent work done is to show up and see what happens. This is the same idea said differently. And that is, most people don't want to do substandard work. They'll forgive other people's substandard work. You know, if you read just an ordinary book, you're not gonna yell at the author, but you're gonna enjoy it. Well, that was, that was fine. You'll say that was fine. If that were your own book, you would say that's terrible. What an ordinary thing, what, what a substandard thing. If it's one of those days where you sent out an email with a typo, we don't like that from ourselves. We can be very harsh on ourselves when we've made a super large error like a typo. 
So I think you can see a budding relationship between self-forgiveness and anxiety management. People have to, in order to feel less anxiety, in order for your clients to feel less anxiety, they have to forgive themselves more, pester themselves less, The specter of judgment is a very big deal thing. People do not like to be criticized. They do not like pushback. And almost everything we do opens us up to judgment. Whether it's, is the house clean enough when the neighbors come by? Two, will this book be roundly panned by every literary agent who reads it? And many people are internally judging themselves all day long. Did I do that right? Was that good enough? Are the dishes clean enough? Et cetera. They're judging themselves internally all day long and making themselves anxious in the process. So if you're working with an anxious client, there are many, many ways, we'll get to this, many, many ways to work with anxious clients. But one of the ways is to help them deal with what they are experiencing as toxic internal criticism. Just as it was for us as kids, it is for us as adults. Darkness and the unknown make us anxious. This is a very big deal idea because let's say you're experiencing something like despair, let's say. And you don't know its source. You can maybe guess, but you don't really literally know its source. Well, then you're in the territory of something that is not known, namely, you don't know what's going on with you. And where are you going to go if you don't know what's going on inside of you? You're going to, you're going to go to the easily acceptable labels of the mental disorder world. So simply because you don't exactly know what's going on inside of you, you may overnight go to the place of clinical depression. That is, you'll go by that label and be in the world of antidepressants and chemicals with powerful effects and powerful side effects. So simply by virtue of landing in an unknown spot, being unable to ascribe what's going on to yourself, you're going to accept what's easily available. And it's going to be handed to you. There's going to be a transaction, right? If you walk into a, a therapist's office or even a GP's office or certainly a psychiatrist's office and you say, you're gonna use the language, right? The current language, you're gonna say I'm depressed and you're gonna get it, you're gonna get that sentence fed back to you. Well, it looks like you're depressed. That's the transaction. I say I'm depressed, you repeat it and we're done. That's why Initial meetings between a patient and a psychiatrist now last 15 minutes. That's how long psychiatrists spend with their patients, 15 minutes. Nothing is done there except a linguistic transaction, a checklist thing. I know I've gone off a deep edge here, but I, I wanted to explain a little bit why something which doesn't sound that important like fear of the unknown is a very big deal thing in the lives of parents, if a parent doesn't know what's going on with, with his troubled child who's bouncing off walls, if he doesn't know what's going on, he's gonna buy what the culture has to say, which is ADHD or pediat pediatric bipolar or oppositional defiant disorder or some label. Rather than, rather than what we hope we would do as coaches, explore what's going on. It's like we've lost that idea of exploring what's going on.
just letting this sit here because this is a super large subject that we're not really going to touch, but it should be clear to us that even if nothing in the moment is making our client anxious, She's having a good day, so to speak. She's not worried about the world or this, that, or the other thing, her kids. She's just not worried today. She's not anxious today. And then some memory arises, percolates up. This is the very heart of the, the thing called PTSD, which is, again, should not be considered a mental disorder, but rather the natural consequences of having terrible experiences. If you had a terrible experience, it's going to return. This is another reason why, and let me underline what I'm about to say, this is another reason why our clients need portable anxiety management techniques. That is techniques they can use in the moment when they become anxious. Lots of our clients do things that make them less anxious, like a full, full on meditation practice or something which makes them less anxious during the meditation practice, which is wonderful, but they need something quick and accessible and portable so that if a painful memory returns, they know exactly what to do to deal with the anxiety that arises in that moment. To use 12 step language, to use addiction language, if you are triggered, you need to know what to do right then and there. And you really wanna help your clients have a menu of portable anxiety management strategies, at least two or three that really work for them so that they, they know that they have something to grab onto in those moments when a painful memory comes up or when, when something obsessional comes up So telling our truth makes us anxious and not telling our truth makes us anxious. We understand why it may not be possible to say something to our mate that we want to say, that we just don't want the repercussions of that conversation. We don't want the consequences of that conversation. So we don't say it and then we're anxious. We're made anxious by our silence. I think it's very important that we help clients, coaching clients, tell their truth, at least to themselves. Whether they say it in the world is a separate question, a separate transaction. But if they're not saying it to themselves, then, then they're going to be physically and mentally unwell. I did a book recently called Redesign Your Mind. The idea of that book has to do with imagining your mind as a room that you can actually redecorate and redesign. And one of the visualizations in that book is installing a speaker's corner, like the one in Hyde Park in London, in your mind, installing a speaker's corner. So at least in that part of your mind, you can tell yourself the truth, that you can feel safe at least that much. I'm gonna start moving a little more quickly because I know I have lots of things to get to. This will surprise you if you haven't thought about it, but the activity of choosing provokes anxiety. Just the activity of choosing, deciding whether to buy this car or that car or to eat this for dinner, or eat that for dinner. All kinds of choices make, all choices make us a little bit anxious and important choices make us very anxious. This is another reason why the creative process is so darn difficult because the creative process is one choice after another. That's what creating is. Put the comma in, take the comma out. Send the character here, send the character there. It's one choice after another. Can you imagine constant choosing? It's amazing that anybody produces anything. Basics, these are things that are gonna make us anxious. 
needing <laughs> things doubling in price as we blink, worldwide uh, inflation, all the things we could name, all of these survival issues are going to make us anxious. Okay, I think I'm gonna skip You'll have these slides. I want to move on to make sure that I get to. I know now. I know I'm now actually going super fast. I understand, but I want to get to what to do. I want to make sure we get here. So, on the one hand, it matters what your source of anxiety is. That is, we good to know so that you could tailor the anxiety management response to the anxiety. Like, if it, what's going on is somebody's jackhammering outside, then you move to another location. That is, if you know that that's what's making you anxious, then you know what to do. But we can also deal with anxiety, even if we don't know what the source of it is, by virtue of having some anxiety management techniques that just work, irrespective of the source of the anxiety. So this is a little model of how to deal with anxiety, or how to help our clients deal with anxiety. First, just to accept that anxiety is not something to, be get, to get rid of. The goal is not to eliminate anxiety. It's an unrealistic goal. It's you have to embrace the fact that anxiety is going to be part of our life. And our goal is to manage it. So we acknowledge that we get anxious, some, sometimes more anxious than other times. We look at that, what's going on. In this context, we learn to practice calmness. And we'll come to that in a moment. And we acquire some anxiety management tools. And I think six is a little different from the, from the other ideas, but I alluded to it earlier. And that is when we have the experience of actually living our life purposes, that reduces our experience of anxiety. Because if we are still searching, if we're still unsettled, if we still don't know what we're doing in life, that's a big anxiety drain. So helping your clients understand or, or investigate what their life purposes are is a big anxiety management tool. Okay, so we're gonna run through some anxiety management tools. Some are very simple, some are more complicated, all are valuable. Little deep breathing works. We've known this for a thousand years. Five seconds on the inhale, five seconds on the exhale, done several times. Thinking thoughts that serve you. If you think thoughts that increase your anxiety, like everything's, everything's terrible today, or the world's going to hell in a handbasket, or if we think thoughts that aren't serving us, they are going to increase our anxiety. One of the high bar, but easy to do things with clients is to make sure they get this phrase. Why don't you try to think thoughts that serve you, as opposed to true or false thoughts, move them off true and false. And two, is this thought serving you right now? That will help them a lot. If you marry these two ideas of a thought that serves and deep breathing, I call these incantations. I did a book on this called 10 Zen Seconds. It's the idea of dropping a useful phrase, a short phrase into a breath. Like I'm completely on the inhale stopping, I'm completely stopping or I trust my resources, or right here, right now. Some set of words that are, it's essentially affirmations in a breath is a way to think of it, but it's very simple to use, to learn to just do a little deep breathing and to have maybe one or two go-to mantras, affirmations, good cognitions that reduce your experience of anxiety. This connects to the idea of redesigning your mind, and that is if you visualize your mind as a room, then you can also visualize that each time you enter it, as you turn on the light, it doubles as a calmness switch. That's a, that's a metaphor for the idea of you talking yourself into the belief that you can be in your own mind more calmly. This is really you having a conversation with yourself, which sounds like I would really like to be a calmer person. I'm just pausing for effect because 
if clients can have these conversations with themselves, they can make dramatic changes in no time at all, just by virtue of this simple idea of a calmness switch. There are physical things to do, body things to do that reduce anxiety. Um, if you are sitting at your computer all day long and are about to send an email that you, that's making you anxious because they might be pushed back, the somatic thing to do is get up and walk around the room. Just getting up will reduce your experience of anxiety. That's just the same as when I mentioned before about inhibited flight and airplanes, getting up and walking up and down the aisle reduces your experience of anxiety. So remember to move. Invite your clients to remember to move. Sounds so simple, but often this is what's going on is that we're feeling trapped without knowing it, feeling without recourse. And all we need to do is get up. There are things called discharge techniques. This one is silent screaming. Oh, sorry, I made a sound. Just some, some different things that actors and performers often learn to get the tension out, to get the anxiety out. By the way, I have a couple of books on this subject. One is Mastering Creative Anxiety, but another one is Performance Anxiety. And in Performance Anxiety, I have lots of these sorts of discharge techniques. You can reduce your experience of anxiety by being mindful and by ceremonially announcing to yourself that you intend to reduce your experience of anxiety. The most classic one is to light a candle. But you can create all, any kind of ceremony or ritual that serves to reduce your experience of anxiety, something that with that intention. Just see if I can say this clearly. Sometimes all a ceremony is doing is giving you space a little breathing space between what was bubbling up in you, the anxiety that was bubbling up in you, and the chance for the anxiety to dissipate. So these ceremonies, whatever their content of the ceremony is, they're valuable just as a buffer, just as a way to take a break from the anxiety. So it kind of hardly matters in a way what the ceremony or ritual is. How it's serving you is just by virtue of the fact that it's giving you a chance to kind of step to the side of the issue Step to the side of th the thing that's bothering you and giving you pause. Don't need to explain this. We all understand this. Disidentification is an idea out of psychosynthesis, uh, a branch of psychotherapy created by the Italian psychologist Asagioli. It's really like detachment in Buddhism. And it's the idea that you are not your actions, your temporal experiences, that you, are, that you are a wonderful, deep, amazing, perfect creature being who's having a bad moment, let's say, or has just done a silly thing. But the silly thing doesn't define you. You are still okay. By doing the separation, maybe the not, if you move from the novel isn't working to I'm a bad writer, or I'm not okay, you've harmed yourself and increased your anxiety. You want to be able to say the novel's not working and I'm still okay. This is another technique out of the acting world, out of the, out of the performing world where you turn away from the stimulus that's increasing your anxiety. For actors, it's often the audience arriving that makes them very anxious, hearing those noises of the audience arriving. So they are actors are trained to go look at the bulletin board in the green room, go, go turn away from listening to the audience arriving. And clients can be helped to learn the idea of turning away from the thing that is making them anxious. If they're having a dispute about their late father's estate with their sister, they can turn away from those emails, not look at them. Sounds simple, but it's amazingly important to not keep 
re-anxieting re yourself by returning to the stimulus that's making you anxious. Maybe you have to titrate those emails. So you look at your sister's emails once every three days, but not every two minutes. If you look at them every two minutes, you'll be made anxious every two minutes. I'm not gonna go over this one. This is again, the idea of building a philosophy of life around the idea of multiple life purposes and making meaning that allows you to stand on solid ground. So much to say about healing and self-care, but the main headline is we're relating anxiety management to overall self-care. That anxiety management is one face of overall self-care. So of course, you're inviting clients to create their menu of self-care strategies. I hope, you're, I hope you're doing that with clients, whatever their work is, if you're doing career coaching or spiritual coaching, whatever it is the coaching, still they have to be in a position to be able to do that thing that they're working on. And to be, be in that position, they have to take care of themselves. This is an idea that, again, I can't really speak to at this moment, but it's the idea of identifying some area of your form personality that isn't working for you. Maybe you're too impulsive or too averse to taking risks or whatever it is. And to use this language of identifying a personality upgrade that you want to make. I'm gonna to start to take more risks, let's say. And connecting that to the idea of, if I become the person that I want to be, if I upgrade my personality, I'm naturally gonna experience anxiety less. That is tying those two ideas together, that personality work is also anxiety management, because it is. All kinds of lifestyle support help with anxiety management. It's well known that for instance, in, in, the, in the first year of college, students start to sleep very poorly for all kinds of reasons. Maybe, maybe they're drinking more, maybe they're taking drugs, maybe it's that they have new friends, so to speak, or maybe they're studying late, but sleep becomes a problem, insomnia becomes a problem. Actually, insomnia is a problem for the number is 80 million Americans suffer from insomnia. These additional problems exacerbate anxiety. So I'm just saying an obvious thing, which is we want to help our clients with all kinds of elements of lifestyle support, good sleeping, good eating, exercise, all the normal things, but they are the things that clients are interested in. They may not come to us with healthy diet being the number one thing they wanna talk about, but it may be the sixth thing they want to talk about. And it may really be on their mind a lot of the day that they want to lose weight or that, there's, that their bad sleep is really interfering with life. What to say, of course, they want, you want to help clients understand that if they improve their circumstances, that will reduce their anxiety. We could spend a lot of time on this, but we can't at this moment. Again, inviting people to dream up experiences that will build their confidence. One that I do a lot with clients, I'll just say it in passing, is I invite them to begin to say things in five words or less, or sometimes seven words or less. I've sort of changed my mind about what the exact number is, but the idea is if you say something very briskly like that, you can't also be apologizing or dodging what you're trying to say or what have you. It builds your confidence and your power to say things with a strong period at the end and only in a few words, like, please stop doing that, period. Not, I wonder if you could possibly, if, if you have the time to stop doing that thing that you sometimes, no one's gonna hear that. And, and you're, not you're not believable. It, it is not believable that you're actually meaning what you're saying when you use that many words. If you try it out for yourself and if you have something hard to say to someone, notice how interesting it is to say it in seven words or less or fewer. I think fewer is the appropriate piece of grammar there. 
conflict provokes anxiety. Many people are in conflict with somebody or other, their mate, their sibling, their parents, their boss. You can look at conflict resolution as a completely separate subject or something that you incorporate into your work with all clients because conflict provokes anxiety, really gets in the way of people doing what they want to do. So you need some ideas about how to help people deal with the conflicts in their life. When we're not prepared, we're more anxious. I often work with writers in the following way. <clears throat> I'll ask dash demand that they have answers for the 12 or 15 normal questions that a literary agent or a publisher might ask them. There are only a certain number of questions that a literary agent might ask a writer. How much of your book is done? Who's its audience, etc. Very straightforward questions, but most writers never write out those questions and answer them. So they're not prepared. So the specter of meeting with a literary agent scares them to death because without quite consciously knowing it, they know they're not prepared because they haven't prepared the answers. Anybody on a job interview would, would logically prepare answers for the question they would be expected to be asked, or at least they ought to prepare those answers to be prepared. So again, you can do this in session. I do this in session, role play preparation. I, I'll be the literary agent and, and let the writer be the writer and we can role play. I'll ask questions and see how anxious the writer gets in the moment in trying to answer the questions without preparation, et cetera. Okay, now I'm really rushing. Let's have some behavioral change. <laughs> we know what that means. Um, I think it's possible to have a very quiet, interesting, deep conversation with clients about, wouldn't you like to just be a calmer person? Maybe fewer dramas, you know? What do you think about that? It's what people want from themselves. They're, they're in the habit of making dramas because that deflects them from the things that they're not wanting to think about. So I think that there's a lovely conversation to be had between coach and client and for a client himself or herself to have with herself about changing her attitude with respect to calmness generally. So some headline tip, let me just see what, if there's more, see how much time I can spend with this. Oh, good. Oh, yay. Good. Okay, so this is a bit of a summary. Expect your clients to be dealing with anxiety, whether or not they're presenting it as their issue. They may be, most clients will not present it as an issue. It's not really their way of speaking. They'll present something else, right? I'm not getting my creative work done or I'm having a hard time at work or having trouble with my kids or whatever it is. But you should know that they're dealing with anxiety. You should just know that that's present. You should be curious if they aren't experiencing anxiety because that may mean that, they've re that they really are using some major defense to deny the anxiety they really are experiencing. That they are really in denial or rational, rationalizing away something or intellectualizing away something or what have you. It's not that you would poke, but you would just listen for language. You would just listen to hear if maybe you can ascertain the anxiety underneath the defenses. You can reframe things as anxiety. I find that very useful. For instance, I always reframe perfectionism as an anxiety state because then that allows us to know how to work. Then we can work on anxiety management. We can work on anxiety management tools. If you don't reframe perfectionism, that's a little hard to understand quite how to work on it. For many things that clients bring, we may want to reframe them in ways that allow us to bring up useful tools. I think it's important to wonder, no matter what a client's working on, just to ask, what are your go-to anxiety management tools? What do you do when you feel anxious? And one client will jokingly say, drink a lot. And you'll say, well, okay, interesting. That that's not exactly the way we hope to go. 
That is, some, some, some clients may express what they do ineffectively to deal with anxiety. That's what people are doing mostly ineffectively dealing with anxiety. But very few, will, some will say, well, I have this great meditation practice, and then you have to remind yourself to go further because that meditation practice is not portable and it's not what they need in the moment. And so you may want to learn a couple of these tools to teach. If you believe that teaching is a part of coaching, I do. But if you believe that teaching is a reasonable part of coaching, then you might want to learn one or two or three anxiety management tools that you learn how to teach. And when it comes up, when it's appropriate, actually say to a client, stop the session. Essentially, you're stopping the session and say, I wonder if we could take a moment and I'd like to share with you an anxiety management strategy that I think might help you. Are you willing? I would, I would get buy-in. I would say, are you willing? If not, if the client's on a roll with what she wants to be talking about, I'm not going to stop the session. I'm happy to let her return to what she, where she wants to go. But if she's willing to play along with me, then I think we're going to have a valuable couple of moments with her learning a new anxiety management tool or two. And then that six, five, and six were the same. Seven is to invite clients to try this out at home, to actually create situations. You can tie this to confidence building. You can say, okay, here's what's going to come up next week. We're announcing this risk that you're going to try to take, this thing that you're going to say to your husband about him not, not bothering you when you're trying to write your novel in the morning. Okay, now that he's retired and wandering around the house and doesn't know what to do with himself, but we know that you're going to have to say something to him. So we're gonna work on you taking that risk and we're gonna work on you making use of an anxiety management tool, putting it in place so that you reduce your experience of anxiety enough that you can take that risk. We're gonna go, we're gonna give you a two-step homework. You're gonna work on the anxiety management tool and then you're gonna take this risk. Okay, right on the hour. Dawn is so proud of me. So let me just, not really summarize, but say um, I invite folks to come visit me at uh, ericmazel.com. My very latest book, if you deal with teens or have a teen, is Why Smart Teens Hurt. That just came out. It's a follow-up to a book called Why Smart People Hurt. It, these are interesting books about the challenges of intelligence, which doesn't get talked about too much because it's like a uh, red flag subject. But these are interesting books. At any rate, if you're interested in learning more about what I do, come to my site, ericmazel.com, or drop me an email at any time to ericmazel at get ready for this hotmail.com. I'm still a hotmail person. Okay, Dawn, let put me put your last slide up, Eric, so we can actually oh, see. Oh, that's right. Last slide, last slide. Yes. Just for those who are more visual than auditory, thank you. Yes, well, well you. done. I am super proud of you. You are getting really, really good at time management because it would just be so easy to sit here and listen to such a wise person for hours, uh, which is why we keep having you back. Uh, so well done. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank and we're you. going to open the floor to questions because there's a lot of interest. I told you Eric was wise. Um, I just wanted to throw in that uh, I can't remember what slide. Oh, slide 13 it was when you mentioned the depression. What I was thinking about when you were talking about that one, Eric, is that uh, Brené Brown has brought out a book on the Atlas of Emotions. Uh, and it's important because the client goes in and says, I'm depressed. And the clinician yes. that subscribe, subscribes something for depression, but their definition of depression is different. So we're making a big assumption that people are talking the same language. So That's the right. coaches... Yes. That's right. If human beings could come in and say, I'm sad, we've lost the word sad. We just lost yeah. the word in this last 50 years of the DSM and mental disorder talking. We've lost the word sad. If a person came in and said, I'm sad, it would be a little harder for the clinician to say, oh, you're clinically depressed. Then the client, would, the client or the patient would have to say, where'd you get that from? I said I was sad. Where'd that come from? But if you come in and you say, I'm depressed, then the transaction is super easy. Mm, yeah so coaches it's well worth uh reading that book because um I, I think she's identified something like 37 emotions whereas most people would just say happy unhappy angry yep. 
Yeah, I think she whittled it down after interviewing thousands of people. It was down to three emotions, but we've got 37. So it's really important when we're talking to our clients, what are they actually saying? So anyway, let's open up the floor to questions because uh, I can see lots of comments about amazing, um, really inspirational, very wise. Thank you. So um, just unmute yourself and um, or raise your hand and ask your questions while we've got Eric in the hot seat, please. I think people want to get back to their croissants. Oh no, it's not your morning, it's my morning. It's your morning. <laughs> Any questions? Wow, you're stunned into silence. Yes, no, I've explained everything. Uh, yeah, yeah, very, very well. Crystal clarity. Yeah. It's great, we don't have to um, stretch okay. for questions. Um, so As let's I, do our usual then and take 30 seconds, uh, sorry, 60 seconds and just either put something in the chat box or on your CPD log. What are your key takeaways that you're going to do differently as a result of um, investing in this time with Eric this evening? So as somebody who's very, um, I suppose, British and un who avoids conflict like the plague, saying what I want to say in seven words or less is probably going to be a challenge for me, but I'm going to go with that one. Yes, it's a, it's an interesting challenge. It's it's really very powerful to, to try and do it or to yeah. actually do it. Very powerful. Yeah. And scary. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because of consequences. Mm -hmm. mm. We do this at the end of the call for each and every masterclass, because if you save your CPD until the end of the week and you think, oh, I'll do my log, you can't really remember it. And as coaches and trainers, we know that the longer we leave taking action or committing to an action, the less likely we are to do it. So good, good, good. Yeah. OK, lovely. So, um, just make a little comment. It's Catherine. Please, yes, please do, Catherine. Yeah. Hello. Uh, so, first, I just wanted to say thank you to Eric and uh, to you, Dawn, for organising this. I found that really helpful, really interesting. And I think one of the things that will really stay with me um, was the possibility of addressing the anxiety that's likely to come from some of the more stretching actions sort of addressing it before it arises even really, helping people to kind of get more savvy to the fact that it'll probably arise, but there's plenty of things we can do with it. So you get kind of double the growth for the, for the yeah, from the, from the one session really. Uh, so yeah, I really like that idea of um, actually discussing that when, when putting actions together. Uh, but yeah, so much in there that's uh, really helpful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good. Okay, before we wrap up, oh, Helen, I can see you'd like to ask a question. Fire away. Thank you, Dawn. Um, Eric, I'm kind of under the impression that a lot of people currently believe that anxiety is something that we need to get rid of rather than it's something that we experience and it's natural to experience anxiety for many of reasons which you've gone through. How do we communicate this to a client that's not something that actually we need to get rid of it's something we learn to live with i think by saying it just the way you said it and then by giving a, sort of an obvious or giving an example that will register uh, for a given client so say for instance i'm working with a writer i'll say okay so when you finish this novel you're gonna go on to your next novel, no doubt. And you know what human beings do? They, they wanna do a more ambitious novel next time. They want seven characters in it rather than four characters. And you know, the very fact that you're gonna try something more ambitious, probably gonna provoke some anxiety because you won't know how to do that one. Now you know how to do the four character novel. Next, you're gonna face the seven character novel. 
that's going to make you anxious, probably. In other words, I'll just sort of speak in their world about the things that they know do make them anxious, but that they haven't labeled that way. Sort of give them the talking points and then give some examples. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. Sure. I think also just realizing that anxiety is just another energy. It's just another word for energy, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. The short answer is absolutely. I wanted to follow up on that with all sorts of ideas, but we're at the end now. <laughs> okay. Well, let me also just remind just says, everybody. Yes, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, just to ship him on that, on that one, it really sounds as if what we're doing is helping enhance people's mindfulness by providing a bit more language and sort of identifying the anxiety for them so that they can use their own mindfulness to spot it more readily. Yeah, and you know, I passed over the slide of how, how, how anxiety manifests. I went by that quickly. But clients may well not understand that they're experiencing anxiety. They may say, I feel, I can't stick with something. That'll be a very typical presentation all over the place. I would reframe all over the place as anxiety rather than maybe where they want to go to ADD. So many clients now are going to are, are, are buying labels like I have an adult deficit you know, attention disorder or this, that. This gives us the opportunity not only to speak to the truth about anxiety, but to keep them from glomming onto those labels that will naturally lead them to chemicals. We're doing, I think we're doing a big service by speaking about anxiety this way, because so many of our clients are looking for a mental disorder label nowadays. They, they, want, they want to feel like they understand what's going on in them. So if they're feeling confused and, and jumpy and what have you, that is anxious, we get to say, oh, you may be feeling anxious rather than you have ADD. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're becoming addicted to labels? We're becoming addicted to labels. And um, oh. yeah, it, it's, it's a world, the exporting of the labels is going very well for big pharma. They're doing a wonderful job of exporting labels worldwide to places where you wouldn't think people would buy those labels, but it's, it's everywhere. Mm. By the way, the ice, yes. for, for folks who don't know, just, just say this, quickly. There are two diagnosing and treating Bibles in the, in the psychotherapy world. One is the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. That's the one used in the United States and a lot of places. And then there's the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases, which follows the DSM, follows the DSM's model. And a lot of the world uses the ICD. Both are equally bad. So which, whichever Bible is being used in your part of the world, whether it's the DSM or the, IC, the ICD, one has to be careful. Hmm. Catherine, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I was just thinking maybe our tendency as human beings is to resort to labels to avoid that slightly more gray, uncertain ground. We try and pin it down and put it in a box to manage it, but actually it's really unhelpful to fix things it doesn't allow them to change yeah and i wonder sorry eric i was just going to say i wonder if it's because we also want to fit into a community of like-minded people maybe yes. yes there's a lot of peer pressure to use the labels even in my own family i have to let people use the labels for their family members i, I don't do my my <laughs> i don't go into my speech about this in the family it can't you know, if somebody in the family wants to say that his or her child has this or that, so be it. I mean, that, that's, that's just the way, that's just, the, this, just where the world is at this split second. Mm, okay. Any other thoughts? I don't want to cut anybody off if they've got a last minute thought. Catherine? Oh, you're clapping. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Well, let me just remind you that on the 7th of December, same time, 5 p.m. UK time, will be six of six uh, of Eric's uh, session. I can't even remember what that title is, but it's going to be as good as this one. I think, um, it's, so... I think, 
I think it's the why smart people hurt one. I think it might be about smart. Yes, yes, because we haven't had that one yet. Okay, cool. And then um, next year, we're going to see a lot more of you because you're going to be doing a mini series for us yep. on business uh, acumen uh, to do with your coaching business. But I'll explain more of that um, at our next session. That'd so thank you very much as usual, Eric. You're an absolute star and a mine of information. You're just so reassuring as well to just normalize our feelings without the the, the labels so yeah. i really appreciate that. that's very liberating and thank you to everybody on the call from all over the all over the globe supporting us uh with your questions and your presence you know showing up is just so important so thank you for your interest and uh, enjoy the rest of your day morning or evening wherever you are and stay safe thank you very much thank you